Bob? 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 Hey, Bob! Bob! It's Sports Center. Jay and Dan is to kick off your week. That's right. The week begins on a Sunday. As far as we're concerned, it does. Um, we're going to start with the U.S. Open. Uh, I had the pleasure of being there. Everyone's saying, well, why didn't Ooh. you stay for the final round? I had to be back for work. You could have stayed for the final round and flown back. But no, you had to leave early and you missed all of this. I but know. lucky for you, Dan, I've got the highlights for you. This is stuff you haven't seen yet. You're going to love it because it is the final round of the U.S. Open. Did you have a good time, by the way? Had a great time. The beautiful part of this world. Okay. Uh, Brooks Kepka trying to become the first player to win back-to-back -back U.S. Open since Curtis Strange in 89. Pretty simple. One-shot lead after a birdie on two. This is the third hole. The world number nine taps in for a second straight birdie to extend his lead. How about Tommy Fleetwood? who, in my opinion, could play a young Mick Fleetwood in a movie about Fleetwood Mac. Heads to the 18th hole, seven under, chasing the first 62 in U.S. Oh, Open on. history. Yeah, the course was playing a bit easier on Sunday. This one, eight feet from the pin, so this sets up a chance for a birdie and a 62. Fleetwood, no. It's a 7 under 63. He's just the sixth player to shoot that score at the U.S. Open. Finished two over and went into the clubhouse waiting. Wow, that is quite a tan line. Let's flash back to Saturday. Phil Mickelson missing that bogey putt on 13. We've all done this. Stop it. Hit it back. It seemed logical to me. Other people were outraged. It's a two-stroke penalty. It's a 10 for Phil. Worst score in a hole at the U.S. Open as a pro for Phil. Sunday, again at 13. It's a par save, and he celebrates like he did the first time he won the Masters. He finished the tournament 16 over par. Dustin Johnson, in search of his second major, needed 38 putts on Saturday. Most of his career, he struggled with the putter on Sunday, 11. It'll be a three-putt bogey. He finished third, three over. Some guy in the gallery, some knucklehead, probably O'Toole. Back to Kepka. <laughs> After a bogey on 11, he bounces back on 16. The approach, 130 yards out. That is nice. Four feet from the pin. Kepka for a two-shot lead over Fleetwood. Fleetwood waiting and watching on Fox, the most highly respected golf broadcaster in the world. Par 418. Kepka. The approach way left gets a bounce off the grandstand. But he's still facing a difficult third shot, and this is real nice. Chips it to within 15 feet of the hole. He needs to get it down in two to win. First putt. A little left. He's got to tap this in. He can't reach the green. And Brooks Kepka is the U.S. Open champion back to back years. Joe Buck with a legendary call. Kepka, the first player to go back to back since 89, winning the U.S. Open by one stroke. He's the fourth golfer. Golfer. Sorry, everybody. I've been off for a couple of days. <laughs> He's the fourth golfer since World War II to win multiple U.S. Open titles before turning the age of 30. The other three, Tiger, Jack, and the Big Easy Ernie Els. He now has two major titles, does Kepka, but only one other career PGA Tour victory other than that, the 2015 Waste Management Phoenix Open. Uh, Kepka also the first major winner to finish over par since Justin Rose finished plus one in 2013. And joining us now from Shinnecock Hills is TSN's golf analyst Bob Weeks. Bob Brooks Kepka goes back to back at the U.S. Open. How is this year's victory different from last year's championship at Aaron Hills? Well, you can look at the two courses to really decide the difference. And I think last year was kind of a wide open 
big field kind of golf course and Brooks Kepka really kind of overpowered it. This time around he used a lot more finesse game. I think he uh, he used his wedges and his putter a lot more especially today. Great up and downs coming down the stretch a bogey on the 11th hole that was a could have easily been a double a great save on 12 a great save on 14. So this one was done a little bit differently and I think it shows that that he's really become a complete player. He's, he's got the game right through the bag right now. And I think you're going to see him uh, use this as sort of a stepping off point to, to really become one of those elite players, or at least be considered one of those elite players up there with Spieth and Dustin Johnson, his good buddy. What a difference a day makes. Shinnecock on Saturday, it was a monster. Scores skyrocketed. So the players, they had to like the adjustments made for the final round. Yeah, it was almost, uh, one pro told me afterwards, it was sort of like a marshmallow golf course out there. I mean, I think they went almost too far the other way in airing and in softness, but after the complaints and everything on Saturday, I think it was a wise move. They, they softened it up, and it wasn't too easy, but there were certainly some low scores. We saw the 63 from Tommy Fleetwood, but there was enough teeth in it down the stretch, and at the end of the week, you know, the winning score is over par. That's always where the United States Golf Association likes to see it, right around even par or so. So I think they got their wish, although it took them a, a couple of um, different rounds on Saturday and Sunday to get it done. Bob, we appreciate it. It looks like they left your light on in your room in the clubhouse. <laughs> I'll go up there and turn it off. <laughs> Stage. Hmm. Sign of things to come. Rainy Champs won seven straight opening World Cup matches, but could not score. Shit, Mexico holds on for a massive one nothing win. The first CONCACAF team to beat Germany in a World Cup game. Mexico becoming just the fourth team to hand the defending World Cup champs a shutout loss in the opener. Mexico had lost its previous two matches against reigning World Cup champs by a combined score of 8-0. That included a 6-0 loss to West Germany in 1978. And we're going to hear from those guys later. But first, Brazil, Switzerland. Brazil's won nine straight opening matches at the World Cup. That is the longest streak in tournament history. They're right at the keeper. He had two shots on goal. Brazil's keeper, Allison. Oh. Top in the Swiss balloon. Brazil fails to win a World Cup opener for the first time in 40 years. In fact, it is the 16th World Cup to include Brazil, Germany, and Argentina. But it's the first time that none of the three won their opening match. And only the third time in Brazil's World Cup history, they failed to win a group stage match after scoring first. Didn't get a chance to say Happy Father's Day, everybody. Uh, everyone of the majors wearing those light blue caps for Father's Day. And Toronto looking to sweep their second straight home series. They were taking on the Nationals. Randall Gritchick. Five of his six home runs this year have come at home. Now 4-3 Toronto. Gritchick. Gritchick's first multi-homer game since July of 2015. Fish with four RBIs on the day. That made it 5-3 Jays. Bryce Harper's been struggling. One for his last 15. Up at the bases loaded in the eighth. Tied at six. Ryan Tapera gets him to fly out to center. Gets out of the jam. Harper 0 for 5 on the day. Held to just one hit all series. Bottom half, Ryan Madsen in the pitch for the Nats. Hasn't allowed a home run in all 25 relief appearances this season. And there's a home run to Teoscar Hernandez. Hernandez 3 for 4 in the day. 12th. Home run of the year puts the Jays up 7 6. And then the next batter, Yan Herbert Solarte. Hey! That's over the Sobe side. The big Sobe's guy. Dulce, big fan of the Sobe. Solarte's team leading 15th. Jays sweep. Sometimes I wonder how pro athletes don't get visibly nervous more often. I mean, when was the last time a pitcher was called up from AAA and put into a major league game later that day only to vomit all over the mound a couple of times? <laughs> Sunday. The answer is Sunday. And the person you're referring to is Adrian Howdy. Oh, no! He barfed in the eighth. Craig Council, his manager, came out to check on him. He probably said, yeah, I barfed. Did you not just see that? Yeah, he has some tum pain. The grounds crew had to clean it up. The umps are laughing. No one's really that concerned. They're just laughing at him. A couple batters later, Hauser again. Oh, no. And Barfy again. 
Oh, no. Uh, I don't think you're going to see me. There he goes. He's barfing sure. again. Now, at this point, you'd think Craig Council might say, you know what, maybe we take you out of the game. You're puking all, all over the field. But no, nope, they're like, he's fine. <laughs> if he barfs three times, we might take him out. But not two. Uh, next hitter, Scott Kingery, and he doubles to left. Now, Hauser would finish the inning. He allowed just one run. Might call it a gutsy performance by the rookie. Hauser down the night Brewers down one down to their final out Christian Yelich a shot to deep center field what a catch by Odubel Herrera to end the game and maybe get that guy to a doctor or WebMD it at least guy keeps no, going up he's fine uh, we are sponsored this walkover clock by NHL entry draft draft hmm. hey um didn't you tell me that a Fredericton brewery is brewing Scrum Lurkers Brew or something? Yeah. Well, yeah, we're not supposed to talk about that. We're <laughs> sponsored by a beer company. Five days in, and England will finally get their FIFA World Cup underway when they take on Tunisia on Monday. You mentioned you weren't going to hear from Luke and the guys again. I knew they'd be back. Here they are. I'm joined by Stephen Caldwell and Christian Jack. England kicking off their campaign in Russia at the World Cup on Monday. And in the past, there have usually been high expectations of England teams, and they failed to deliver. It's different this time around, though. It seems as if more realistic expectations are in play. Overrated in the past. Are they underrated now, Stephen? I don't know about underrated, but there's no doubt about it that... Gareth Southgate's did a really good job of managing expectations through this tournament. I think what the exciting thing about this England squad, squad KG is that they have that youthfulness to them and, and they could, if they have a decent tournament, progress into the next tournaments with some kind of momentum. As you said, expectations are quite realistic at the moment. They're not underrated because I think obviously the expectations are set low for a reason. And obviously past managers have actually been haunted by the past. The successes have been very difficult in this tournament. But they've been placed in a rather comfortable group that people in England expect them to get through. I think that's fair. And after that, we'll have to see what they do in the knockout stage. Belgium against Panama, one of three games on the schedule on Monday. Yeah, Monday, Monday is a uh, busy one. Wake up and you can have some pancakes or waffles, which are way better than pancakes. And you can watch Sweden and South Korea, and you can switch to a different food for Belgium and Panama. Maybe, and then, maybe waffles. And then you can have some lunch, maybe a BLT to watch uh, Tunisia and England. Or maybe a full English breakfast for that one, which would be a lot to eat after all those waffles and pancakes. Hey, uh, Dan, you remember when this guest joined us last month? Who's that now? At the trade deadline, we had your name pretty yeah. high on the on the list, on the trade bait list. Are you getting calls from your agent? Are you getting calls from buddies back home? Are you talking to your dad? Like, what's it like when you're very clearly, very obviously, potentially going to get dealt? Yeah, it was a little weird. I mean, something I haven't experienced before, but uh, you know what? It's uh, a lot of it's just rumors, I guess. And um, you try and be a pro about it and realize your job is just to, to play hockey. and. Um, and everything else would just kind of fall into place. So um, I'm happy it didn't happen, but uh, you know what? If it did, it was just part of the game. It did. The Habs and Coyotes made the first big move of the offseason Friday night about 9.30 Eastern. Weird time to make the deal, but they did it. Max Domi to Montreal in exchange for Alex Galchenyuk. And then Domi signs a two-year bridge deal. Domi uh, is excited. Averages uh, just over $3 million a season. Domi, good follow on the social media. He's a very good follow on the social media. His picture with his dad for Father's Day uh, was just as awkward as you would hope it would be, the way they they embraced each he other. He takes a lot of Instagram videos of just his dad. Yeah. <laughs> he like, hey, dad. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Ty tells a lot of dad jokes, you know, like, oh, I <laughs> take out your wallet, Max. And, and he, you know, pretends there's dust coming out of the wallet. <laughs> It uh, should be. They should have their own show. It's very entertaining. Uh, Galchenyuk found out about the trade on a flight to Italy for vacation. So he's lucky there was Wi-Fi on that plane. Again, Wi-Fi never works for me on those planes. Go-Go. <laughs> is, is that the Go-Go network? That it's on? No, what is it? Google or Goggle? Time waits for no man. Seems like it's been mostly Debbie Downer news about Milos Raonic the past year or so. No title since 2016 in Brisbane down from three to number 35 in the rankings. He also skipped the French Open 
with an undisclosed injury. But Sunday, he was facing new world number one Roger Federer in the final of the Stuttgart Open. Brownich hasn't dropped a set thus far in the tournament. Playing close to his best tennis on grass, so said he. Milo serving, Federer a terrific forehand winner. Roger playing in his first yeah. tournament since early March. He sat out the clay court season. Goes up an early break. Now up 4-3 on serve, Federer, cross court winner. Already guaranteed to regain the world number one ranking come Monday, following his semifinal win. He took the first set 6-4, tied at one of the second. Raonic, the forehand winner. Milos didn't drop a service game in the second set, but Federer was just as sharp. On serve down 5-4 from the baseline. How about that forehand? This one went to a tiebreaker. Milos down 5-3, comes to the net. But the Raj, with another winner, he'd take the tie break, he'd take the match in straight sets, he would win his 99th career title and third this season. Good to see him back. I just want to mention something. I was walking around the TSN offices today, and I just happened to see a stack of Sports Illustrated magazines, and look at this. It's last year's Sports Illustrated with Brooks Kepka on it, winning the U.S. Open. And the subscriber? Gino Retta. <laughs>
I love when you, when tourists come to drone and they're like, yeah, you go to the CN Tower and then you get up there and you're like, what now? Yeah, what do I do now? Look down this glass floor? Oh, I can't do that. That's it's too terrifying. Terrifying. Finally, David Aoki asks, why is it Jay and Dan and not Dan and Jay? Because Dan and Jay just sounds weird. Jay and Dan. That's really why. This has been <laughs> the Jay and Dan mailbag. Actual letters from actual viewers uh, sent to us on the Twitter. Okay, so here's another fan running onto the field. This is the College World Series. Oh! Browns crew going low. Just don't run on the field anymore. What possesses people? Just the booze? <laughs> I get it. Uh, yeah, I think just the booze. Okay. Uh, That's hi, Lennon. Come up. And I blew it big time. It's all me on our You Blew It segment. I couldn't say the word golfer in the U.S. Open highlights. What did uh, you say? I, I think I said blue fruit or something. All right. I said it was Roger Federer's 99th career ATP title. It was his 98th. Hmm. I said Tom Brady had Botox. I have no proof of that, so I take that back. And I looked at Bob Weeks' collar. This was my mistake. I just pointed this mistake out. Uh, Bob Weeks needs someone. Keep an eye on that collar. That's, fl that's flying up. Yeah, he's got half up, half down. Now, he's in a very, you know, in that part of the world, Southampton, you got a lot of preppy guys that pop their collars, right? You saw it. A lot of dress shirts and shorts. Right. So maybe he just, he was half into it. He's like, I'm going to dip my toe into this world. I'll just put one collar up or something. What a weekend it was.